and in this video I'm going to talk about Zone 1 training and why it is worth doing. I will also review some research looking at how elite athletes actually train. There are a number of different intensity zone schemes out there. This three zone scheme uses zones that are clearly defined by physiological markers. These being the lactate and or ventilatory turn points. Thus zone one is below that first lactate turn point. Zone two is in that threshold zone, middle zone, and zone three is above that second turn point. This scheme is used in many of the studies which look at training intensity distributions in athletes. Now most coaches, myself included, use a five to seven zone scheme where zone one from this three zone scheme is now broken into two zones. But for this video, when I talk about zone one, I will be referring to zone one from the three zone scheme. So this is where you would train at an effort that is below the lactate at threshold. It should feel comfortable, sustainable, and you're not accumulating a lot of lactic acid or undue stress or fatigue. So reason number one to train in zone one more is to use it for recovery. This is where you would run, swim, or bike at the easiest end of zone one. In fact, you can't really go easy enough. I usually do these at a heart rate of around 100 for the bike or 50% of my functional training power. The idea is to get blood flow to the legs without adding any stress. Your legs should feel better after doing them. If they feel worse, then you either went too hard or maybe you need to completely take the day off. Reason number two to train at the low end of zone one is when you are trying to increase your training volume and or increase the time or distance of your long run or ride. Increasing your total training volume is important for improving endurance performance. One resulting adaptation is an increase in something called mitochondrial mass. Mitochondrial mass is an increase in the size and the number of the mitochondria within the trained muscle. The mitochondria with the aerobic conversion of substrates such as fat and glucose are converted to energy for muscular work. Having more mitochondria will help shift this curve to the right, increase your speed at your th lactate threshold, one of the best predictors of endurance performance. Now high intensity training on the other hand does not result in big increases in mitochondrial mass. Rather, high intensity workouts and in particular sprint training result in improved mitochondrial function or respiration and improved ability to produce more ATP per mitochondria unit. More importantly from this study, we can see that higher training volume was associated with improved race performance, in this case in Ironman. So the higher the training volume, the better the performance, but more on this study later. Now it makes sense that when training for a long event, like an Ironman, that doing high volumes of training would be beneficial. So let's take a look at how elite athletes train across a variety of different sports and disciplines. This was a study of cross-country skiers and their training in the year prior to the Olympic Games. Cross-country skiing is one of the most aerobically demanding of sports, and these athletes are known for their exceptionally high aerobic capacity or VO2 max levels. Yet here we see that throughout the year, the preponderance of their training is performed at relatively low intensities. Here we see it represented in a different way. This is Kipchoge's training intensity distribution prior to his world record marathon run in Berlin. Again, as you can see, a large portion of training was below that lactate threshold and slower than marathon race pace. This was a study on elite rows. What is interesting is that these athletes were training to compete in an event that takes six to seven minutes, yet they also did extensive training in zone one in spite of the fact that during their event, they are performing at efforts that far exceed this. The article went on to say that they did virtually no training at threshold efforts and only a small proportion of their training, four to 10% was at very high intensities with 90% or more at low intensities. So why is it then that when training for such short events, so much should be done below the lactate threshold? The reason being that once you exceed about 75 seconds of maximal effort, the aerobic system predominates. Thus, if your event is 90 seconds or more, you really need to train that aerobic system and the best way to do that is to do a lot of volume in zone one. The general perception, of course, is that when we think of elite athletes and how they train, we often hear how hard they train. And there is some truth to that. But I think this quote by a coach of world champion athletes sums it up nicely. My experience as a coach tells me that to become world champion endurance 
disciplines. You have to train smart and you have to train a lot. <laughs> One without the other is insufficient. We talked about why it is important to train a lot, but the training smart part is this, my third reason to train more in zone one. Reason number three, if you train too hard on your easy days, you can't train hard on your hard days. Trust me, I have personally learned this the hard way. There have been times when I've had an easy session scheduled and then for whatever reason, I part just a little bit too hard. And then the next day when I have intervals, I'm just flat and can't go as hard as I need to. As a coach, one of my biggest challenges sometimes is to get my athletes to go easy. So I was heartened by this study, which looked at what coaches prescribe and what athletes actually do. And here's what they found. The athletes went too hard on their easy days, as computed by a calculation of total training load. And as you can see, they did not go as hard as prescribed on their hard days. In addition, the study reported that several athletes trained on days intended by the coaches to contain little to no training. Thus, the study concluded these data demonstrate a plausible scenario whereby the training pattern observed might contribute to suboptimal performance. This is consistent with the concept that a common training mistake is the tendency for training load to regress to the mean, i.e. a higher proportion of trainings performed in the middle or somewhat hard zone and not enough in the easy zone and not hard enough in the hard zone. But wait a second, if I have limited time to train, shouldn't I just skip the easy stuff and go for more quality? So this study by Steven Seiler's group put this question to the test. Steven Seiler popularized the idea of polarized training, or hard on your hard days, easy on your easy, day, easy days, and not a lot of stuff in the middle. In this study, they had two groups of age group athletes with limited training time, about four hours a week. And they had one group who did more somewhat hard training, the typical pattern, and the other group which did about 80% of their training in zone one, with the balance being in zones two and three. One of the first things they found was that a number of the athletes weren't very good at doing the training as prescribed. In those that did train easy when they were supposed to, they found that after 10 weeks of training, their 10 kilometer running performance improved significantly more than the somewhat hard group. In fact, they improved by 7%, whereas the other group only improved by 1.6%. The article concluded that a greater focus on between thresholds training between those two turn points, or that middle zone, is not associated with greater performance improvements in runners, despite a low weekly training volume. Yes, doing some intense training is critically important and provides a boost to performance, but more is not always better. Based on this review of the research, they found that four endurance sessions or zone one sessions a week plus one high intensity and one threshold session re resulted in improved running speed at VO2 max and improved running economy. However, further intensification of training when they did only two zone one sessions and three high intensity sessions and one threshold session gave no additional adaptive benefit. However, it did increase training stress and indicators of overreaching. In fact, even doing three to four high intensity sessions a week was more effective at compromising performance, not improving it, and inducing overreaching and possibly overtraining. Okay, so I wanted to get back to the study on Ironman triathletes. Of interest is they spent most of their time in zone two during the race, but in training they spent more time in zone one. The law of specificity, therefore, should tell you that you should train a lot in zone two, right? What they found was, as previously mentioned, the higher the training volume, the better they did, and the more time they spent in zone one training, the better they did. But more time in zone two was actually associated with slower race time. Now, this is not to say you should never do zone two or threshold training, but just that you have to be judicious in how much time you spend training and when you do it in your training cycle. They concluded that race-based workouts were important. However, too much wasn't helpful. Rather, accumulating more in zone one was more helpful. So I'll finish with this quote, low intensity, longer duration training is effective in stimulating physiological adaptations and should not be viewed as wasted training time. Okay, in the next video, I will talk about how to calculate your zones and some strategies to train in zone one.